I think the biggest fear veterans have around home ownership is the fear that they're not going to be able to qualify for the house that they want. So in this video, we're going to break down exactly what veterans need to know that are looking to use their VA loan for the very first time to achieve their home ownership goals. When it comes to your ability to get a VA loan, the lender is going to be looking for five key factors, eligibility, income, assets, liabilities, and credit. Let's talk about eligibility. Eligibility is simply whether you can or cannot get a VA loan. The people who are eligible for a VA loan is going to be depending on different statuses, whether you served on active duty, whether you're in the Reserve or National Guard, or whether you may even be a surviving spouse. That is going to determine whether or not you are actually eligible for a VA loan, in which it will show when you get a certificate of eligibility. Now, you can pull your certificate yourself, but I actually recommend you use that as a very good test for the lender that you're working with. Some lenders do not really know how to pull a certificate for you when others do. If you're working with a VA knowledgeable lender who has an understanding on how VA loans work, they will be able to get your certificate on your behalf which I would recommend you go that route because it's going to be quicker for you to get it. And also it's going to be a good test to see whether or not you are working with a VA knowledgeable lender. Now let's talk about income. What the lender is going to use is your gross monthly income for your ability to qualify. And so when doing this, they're going to have to take a look at how you're receiving that income. So let's start with W-2 wage earners, whether that's on active duty or whether that's from the civilian sector. If you are receiving W-2 income, then they're going to need your last 30 days of pay stubs or LES to factor in how much money you're receiving every single month. And then that will also be supported by the W-2s that you have received for the last couple of years, regardless of whether your income has been increasing or if your W-2s maybe show a lower amount, because a lot of times your income could potentially be increasing over time. That's okay. The W-2s are just there more to support the income that is on the LES or pay stub. Let's say maybe you have transitioned to different jobs and you have gone from one job to the next or one employer to the next. You see, a lot of people think that they need to be at the same job for two years and that's not exactly true. What they're looking for when trying to qualify you is whether or not you have been in the same line of work for two years. So if you're on active duty and maybe you have transitioned to a different rank or to a different job within the military, that's perfectly fine. You won't run into issues there. If maybe you were on active duty and then transitioned to the civilian sector, that's okay as well. They're actually very flexible when people are transitioning from active duty to the civilian sector, even though you may not have done the same job in the military that you're going to or currently are doing in the civilian sector sector. Now, where it can get tricky in this situation is maybe where you have been in the civilian sector for several years and you have changed careers. That's where it can get tricky because what they're looking for is like income. There are several different reasons why people do change jobs, but if they're in the same line of work, you should not run into any issues. Where you can run into issues is when people transition from W-2 earning to self-employed. If you have transitioned from W-2 earning to being self-employed within two years, this can cause you to not be able to qualify because you have gone from what's called stable income to now looked at as potentially fluctuating income. You see, for self-employed earners, what they're going to require is that you have been in not only the line of work, but with that particular business for at least two years. Even if you've been in the line of work for more than two years, but you haven't been self-employed for two years, that's unfortunately not going to be able to fly. I've seen it commonly in many different forms of employment where somebody had gone from working for an employer to starting their own business in that same field. They maybe are making more money in this situation situation, but in that situation, they're also going to be responsible for other expenses for the business to where you are not going to be able to use your gross income for self-employed income. They're actually going to use your net income, which means that you're going to have to be able to provide your tax returns for at least the last two years to determine how much you would qualify for on a VA loan. But this is strictly going to be for self-employed. For those of you that are maybe receiving commission income or even 1099, this is also looked at similarly to self-employed income. You do have to to have been receiving that type of income for at least two years. For those of you receiving non-taxable income, like maybe a pension, VA disability, SSDI, or social security, that type of income is going to be acceptable on day one. You do not have to have been receiving it for at least two years for it to be able to qualify. So don't feel like you have to wait if you are in that bracket. My name is Josh and I educate veterans, active service members, and real estate professionals around everything they need to know about the VA loan. So if you want to stay up to date about tips, tricks, hacks, and news, subscribe and join the community. The next thing the lender is going to look at is your assets. You see, when buying a home, even though the VA loan does not have a down payment requirement, there is still closing costs when getting a home. And that still does apply on VA loans. This is actually a big misconception or myth around VA loans that I often see veterans misunderstanding. And so that's why I want to break it down in this video. You see, closing costs are for things like taxes and insurance that are going to be rolled into your escrow account and other things that go along with buying a home that you're going to end up having to pay for. Now, closing costs can vary depending on where 
where you are located. But I typically would say a good rule of thumb for closing costs is going to be anywhere between one and a half to about two and a half percent of the sales price of your home. So if you're buying a property that's, let's say, four hundred thousand dollars, two percent of that would be eight thousand dollars. That's what I would say to be prepared for as potentially what your closing costs could be. How those closing costs are paid could vary in multitudes of ways. The first way I have seen closing costs covered is obviously going to be the veteran paying it out of pocket at closing. That's one way it can be done. Obviously, if the veteran has the funds available, that's the easiest way for it to be done. The next way it can be done is I've seen it where it is negotiated that the veteran is going to receive seller credit from the seller that they are buying the home from. This is also a very common way that you can actually have your closing costs covered in this current climate where home prices are kind of staying a little bit flatter and we're not seeing as much competition in the market. So if you're looking at buying a home and you don't have very much money saved up, buying a home in a market like this does create a lot of opportunity for veterans to be able to get those closing costs covered by the home seller. The next example is going to be where maybe you are going to negotiate it into the sales price of the home. Let's say you have a home that's listed for $400,000 and instead of offering $400,000, you're going to now offer maybe $410,000, but then ask the seller to give you a $10,000 credit. What would have to happen in this situation is the home would just need to be able to appraise for $410,000 so that way you're essentially able to roll those closing costs into your loan. Some ways veterans could have reserves are going to be in your checking or savings account, but another way reserves actually can count on a VA loan is going to be for things like a 401k or even a TSP account. You actually can pull money from your 401k or your TSP towards buying a house. The next one is going to be liabilities. When it comes to liabilities, what they're looking for is things showing up on your credit. Things like auto loans, personal loans, student loans, credit cards. Those are going to be the main items that they're going to be looking for. If you are obligated to pay alimony, child support, or separate maintenance, those things will have to count as well, in which they'll be able to satisfy or confirm based off of a divorce decree or a court order. Now, when it comes to those liabilities, what they care about is actually not the balance. So I wouldn't get too wrapped up in how much your balance says. What I would worry about is how much the monthly obligation is. A lot of people actually disqualify themselves from potentially becoming homeowners because they think that a large balance for things like a student loan is going to keep them from being able to buy a house when really on a VA loan, all they're really worried about is how those monthly liabilities from a monthly perspective affects their monthly gross income like we talked about earlier. So when going through this process, do a deep dive on what your monthly liabilities are versus what your monthly gross income is to get a better idea of roughly where you're at. Now that the lender has your monthly liabilities in hand and your monthly income, this is where they're going to be able to bridge the gap towards that infamous term debt to income. On a VA loan, debt to income ratio is actually not the final say. VA uses a little thing called residual income to determine how much they're going to expect you to have left over after all of your bills are paid. In many situations, residual income could equal out to where a veteran's actual debt to income ratio is significantly higher. For example, I have seen veterans with a 70% debt to income ratio be able to purchase a house. And that's simply because they met the VA's residual income requirement. You see, that residual income requirement is going to look at first where you're located geographically in one of these four regions, and then they're going to look at your household size. From that, it will determine exactly how much you need to have left over after all of your bills are paid. That could mean that your debt to income ratio is significantly higher and still mean that you're able to buy a house. The last one of our major five things that the lender is going to be looking for is your credit. When it comes to your credit on a VA loan, there is technically no credit score requirement. Yes, you heard me correct. But what you need to understand is the VA does not do loans. The VA only guarantees the loan, which means that it's up to you to work with a lender that fits that particular criteria. Most lenders are going to require at least a 620 credit score on a VA loan, where some out there like me and my team will accept as low as a 580. And there even are situations where we have been able to accept credit scores below 580. For example, we helped a veteran with a 542 credit score be able to use his VA loan, and that was through the manual underwrite. The reason I bring this up is because there are a lot of veterans who disqualify themselves based off of their credit score and their debt to income ratio. And both of those things, as I just told you, are not necessarily the end all be all when it comes to getting a VA loan. At the end of the day, getting pre-approved by a VA expert is vital for veterans to have a smooth home buying experience. And I highly recommend that you do this by not jumping on Google, because all that's going to happen is you're going to see the first few VA lenders that have massive marketing budgets, but little care for your unique situation. Working with a VA lender 
that actually understands the VA loan and also wants to understand your situation is going to have a better understanding of what options are available to you. If you want to work with me and my team, I have a team of loan officers that specialize in the VA loan and are licensed in all 50 states. And we also have the ability to connect you with VA knowledgeable real estate agents in your local market. If you want to get help with that, click the next steps link down below in the description and I'll be happy to connect you. The last thing I want to leave you with, Jesus loves you and he paid the ultimate price for your life. So if you turn to him, trust in him and believe in him, he has a beautiful plan and purpose for you and your family.